Jema Maya Ki Je Bashvash Farimati Ki Je Bule Baba Ki Je. We go on with chapter 11 in the Devi by Ramesh Menon. King Janama Jaya said to Veda Vyasa, Who is this boy Astika who appeared so suddenly and thwarted my yagya? Why did he save Takshaka's life? Veda Vyasa replied, once there was a rishi called Jagat Jaratkaru, who was celibate and a man of peace. As he roamed the forest one day, he saw in a secret cave the spirits of his ancestors. They said to him, child, you must marry the hen and have a son. Only then will your fathers find heaven for ourselves. Jaratkaru replied, if I find a young woman without searching high and low for her, and if she is implicitly obedient to me in all things, always I will marry her. And he went on an extensive Tirtha Yatra to every sacred ford in the land. Sometime before this, it happened that Keshapa Muni's two wives, Kadru and Vinata, between whom there was always sharp envy, had a wager between them. Kadru saw Surya Deva's blazing steed in the sky and thought of a base plan to deceive Vinata. She went to her before the sun rose that next day and said, Do you know what color the sun's horse is? Vinata said, Of course, who doesn't know the sun's horse is white? But Kadru said, Are you certain? And Vinata was. Kadru said, If the sun's horse is black, will you be my slave forever? And if the creature is white, Will you be mine? Agreed, said Kadru, and Vinata thought she could not lose this wager, who didn't know that the sun's horse was pristine white, just like the sun's light. But Kadru called her sons, the great serpents, and said to them, Children, cover the sun's chariot horse with your bodies so that it seems black tomorrow. Some of the snakes demurred, and their mother cursed them. May you fall into Janamajaya's fire. The others did as Kadru asked. They entwined themselves around the sun's white horse, and that best beast seemed night black when Kadru and Vinata saw it. Vinata ran to a lonely place and began to sob heartbroken. Her son Garuda saw her with eagle eyes, and flew down to comfort her mother, his mother. Garuda said to Vinata, Mother, why are you crying? Tell me what ails you. Vinata sobbed, Ah, uh, I have become Kadru's sa- slave. Garuda went to Kadru and offered to show her and her sons the world. He took them on his back and flew across the awesome sea. On the other side, the man-bodied eagle headed Garuda, asked Kadru, is there any way in which my mother can escape being your slave? Thinking for a moment, Kadru replied, Fetch some Amitra Amrita from heaven for my serpent children to drink, and your mother shall be free, a free woman. Garuda flashed into Devaloka like a golden arrow, and beating Indra and his devas back fiercely, made off with the chalice of Amrita. He brought the chalice to Kadra, who cried, Vinata is no more my slave. Her serpent sons went to purify themselves with a bath before they drank the nectar, and Indra spirited the precious chalice away. When the snakes came back clean, ready to quaff the Amrita, Amrita and become immortal, they found the nectar gone. In despair, they began to lick the sword-shaped kusa grass on which they had left the chalice, which is why they and their children after them have forked tongues, for the blades of grass divided them. The serpents whom their mother cursed to die in Janamajaya's yagya, when they refused to cover the sun's horse to make it seem black, flew to Rama for refuge. Among them was the majestic Naga Basuki, whom the devas and the asuras had once coiled around the golden Mandara, when they churned the ocean of milk. When he heard why they had come, Brahma said, Basuki has a sister named Jarad Karu. Let her be given in 
marriage to the Rishi of the same name, and they will have a son who will save you all from Janamajaya's Sarpa Yagya. Thus Vasuki and his serpent went to the Muni Jarakaru and begged him to take their sister for his life, wife. The Rishi said, I will, but let her be warned that if she disobeys me in the least thing, I will leave her. Thus the Muni Jarakaru married the comely Nagin Jarakaru, and they lived happily in the Bama in a white hut made of leaves and branches. Of course, the Nagan assumed an enticing human form, and Jarkaru was well satisfied with her. She came to love her husband, and never in the least thing did she cross him. One afternoon, Jarkaru fell drowsy and decided to fall asleep. He said to his wife, I'm going to sleep now. Don't wake me for anything. She busied herself with housework. The sun sank in the sky and shadows lengthened. The Muni Jarkaru slept on. His wife grew anxious that night was falling and it was time for his twilight, a sandhya, or prayers. She was afraid that darkness would set in without her husband having lit the evening lights of worship. But her husband had said he must not be disturbed for anything and she knew he had sworn to abandon her if she ever disobeyed him. Yet, if the sandhya worship were not observed, Dharma itself would be breached. Trembling, Jaratkaru, the Nagan, shook her husband awake. The Muni opened his eyes and roared, Dare you disobey me? I told you I was not to be awakened for anything. Leave my house this instant, haughty woman. Go back to your brother. Tears in her eyes, as her, his wife whispered, what of, the cause, what of the cause for which my brother gave me to you? Her husband said, that is already within your womb, and turned away from her forever. The Nagan Jarakaru went home to her brother, Vasuki, and told him the Rishi had turned her out and what he had said at last. Vasuki was certain a Muni like him will never lie and kept his sister with him. In time, she gave birth, O king, to the brilliant Astika, who came to your Sarpa Yagya and saved the lives of Takshaka and his race, said Vedavyasa to King Janamajaya. But the king was still distraught. My father's spirit has no peace and never shall, for my Sarpa Yagya has been abandoned. Vyasa said, build a temple to the Divine Mother and worship her with the Amba Yagya. No family that does not worship the Devi has any peace, and those that do are given their hearts every desire and muksha thereafter. Gentleman Jay has said, Blessed Vyasa, tell me more about the Devi. I would hear her sacred Purana from your lips. And Veda Vyasa told the king, the Devi Bhagavatam, to bring some repose to his anguished heart. Chapter 12, Janamajaya asked Veda Vyasa, who is this divine mother, Amba, you asked me to worship? Where was she born? Who were her father and mother? Omniscient Veda Vyasa, enlighten me about the Devi. I have thought that Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva are the three gods who create, preserve, and destroy the universe. Is there any other beyond these three? Aren't they eternal? Vyasa said with a smile, once as I walked along the banks of the river Ganga, I saw that Narada Muni sat plunged in Dhyan beside the murmuring river. He sat in Padasama, and the lotus posture and his eyes shut, and his face utterly serene. I approached Brahma's son softly and waited for him to emerge from his meditation. When Narada opened his eyes, I prostrated myself at his feet in the sand. He laid a hand on my head in blessing and asked in his bright and friendly way, Vyasa, your face is burning with a question in your heart. Tell me, what do you want to know? I said eagerly, Master, who is the origin of this infinite, infinite universe? Where does this Brahmanda come from? Some of the wise say Shiva, Others, Vishnu, yet others are certain that Brahma is the first creator. 
Then there are those that will worship only Surya Deva, the splendid sun, and others only Indra. So too, Varuna, Agni, Vayu, Soma, Yama, Kubara have their bhaktas, as do Ganapati and Kartikeya. Then, my lord, there are the bhaktas of the Devi, who insist that she is the prime creatrix, the source from whom all the other gods have come. Thus say that Devi Bhagavani, these say that the Devi Bhagavani is Saguna and Nirguna, as well of infinite forms and formless too. They say she gives all their heart's desires to her and even moksha if they want. My heart is roiled with confusion, Narada, and indeed this life is full of darkness as it is of light. There is as much suffering and death on earth as there is joy and pleasure. I feel like a drowning man whose head is plunged repeatedly under a sea of doubts. I beg you, enlighten me, save me. Narada said to me, smiling, Vyasa, once I too was tormented by this same confusion and took my doubts to my father. I said to Brahma, my father, Lord, what is the root of this cosmic plant, the universe? Are you its first creator or is Shiva or Vishnu? Whom should I worship as the highest God? I have prayed at all the sacred sites, yet my heart finds no peace. Rama said to me, only the unattached know the answer to the ultimate mystery. Once, when the universe lay dissolved in the primal sea of Ekarnava, Vishnu lay plunged asleep upon his serpent bed, which floated on those waters. A golden lotus sprung from his navel, and I was born within it. I saw no land, no sun, moon, stars, no mountains, or anything other than the single ubiquitous sea. And I wonder, who has created me? Who will protect me? Who will protect and destroy me? Whom shall I worship? I asked myself and heard a voice speak out of the sky. Tapasya is your way. So I sat in Tapasya for a thousand years in the lotus in which I was born. Then the voice spoke to me again, create. It said simply, as I wondered what it was I must create, the Danava, Madhu, and Kataiba appeared, roaring at me, come fight or be our slave. I clambered down the, in the stalk of the golden lotus and saw the most wondrous being lying on the coiled and infinite serpent upon the darkling sea. His complexion was deep blue like the rain cloud, and he wore beautiful yellow silk. He was four-armed. A wildflower garland was around his throat, and his four hands bore, bore a conch, disc, a mace, and a longbow. He was the lord of the universe, I knew, but he lay plunged in Nidra, deepest slumber. I remembered the Devi then and began to honor her and praise her. Soon she left Vishnu's body, and he awoke. For 5,000 years, he battled <coughs> these two Asuras, Madhu and Kataba, until finally he slew them. It was then that Shiva joined us too. Suddenly, the sky above was lit with a blazing radiance and we saw the exquisite Devi had appeared within the light. She said to us in an entirely lovely voice, now create, sustain, and destroy the universe until the next Kalpa comes. But we asked mother, how shall we create when there is no elements to create them from? No earth, fire, water, or air, but only this endless sea. <clears throat> the Devi smiled and a shimmery vimana flew down from heaven, a crystal ship. A jeweled stairway stretched down from the wondrous craft and at the Devi's word, we three climbed into it. Without a whisper, the vimana, the celestial ship, rose into the sky and flew at such a speed that one, our very bodies turned into luminous vapor until we slowed down and saw that we hovered above the earth, blessed Bhumi, <clears throat> the earth that was not meant to exist, for Shiva had destroyed it by calling down the sun 
and then it had rained without pause and everything was absorbed into the primordial sea. But here we were <coughs> in a precious crystal ship hanging over a familiar blue-green world that was certainly real. We landed softly on that earth, choked in Maya, so that none of us saw us, but we saw them. Excuse me, so none of them saw us, but we saw them. There were rivers and forests, mountains, continents and ocean. Men and women lived on that planet as did plants, great and small, and birds, all manners of living creatures. We were astounded. This was another Earth, exactly like the one the three of us created, preserved, and destroyed. As if in response to a doubt that sprang up in our hearts, the crystal ship rose away from that world silently and flashed into the sky at breathtaking speed. The azure firmament meant parted for us like another sea, and we flew into a marvelous realm, Devaloka, the heavens of that earth. There we saw Indra and his devas dwelling in Amravati, as magnificent and rather like the one we ourselves had known, which now lay plunged in the primordial sea. Devaloka was full of unearthly splendorous beings. We saw the Lord Indra, with his Shachi, we saw Varuna, Soma, Agni, Kubera, Su, Surya, Yama, and all the Devas. We heard the Devi's soft laugh, and again the mystic ship flew up high in the twinkly of an eye. Next we arrived in Brahmaloka, that is heaven for the Devas. We were amazed to see another Brahma in the Loka esconded in his marvelous palace. In his sabar were all the Vedas and their Angas, the Nagas, the mountains, the oceans, and rivers. Vishnu turned to me and breathed, Brahma, who is this four-faced one? And I had to reply, I do not know, Vishnu, why I am uncertain who I myself am now. Next to our ship flitted in a wing to icy Kailasha, austere, auspicious, auspicious mountain. We were delighted to see the yakshas at play and all the beautiful birds. And in the cave on that mountain, we saw the three-eyed Lord Shiva wearing tiger skin and elephant hide, seated serenely in yoga asana, meditating. At the mouth of the deep cavern at hand, we saw resplendent Ganapati and Nandi, with an elephant, Ganapati with an elephant's head and six face Kartikeya. The Lord's Gana thronged that mountain. We were speechless with amazement, most of all our own Shiva. The Vimana rose softly away from Kailash and now flew in moments to another wonderful aquamarine city. And here, of course, we saw another Vishnu, four armed to skin the hue of the Atasi flower wearing beautiful ornaments. We saw the exquisite Lakshmi sitting at Vishnu's side, and our Vishnu trembled. He had broken out into a fine sweat. We sat in the Vamana and stared mutely at each other. All that we had taken for granted always was the dust of illusion. Again, the sky ship flashed away and brought us to a sea of nectar upon a magical island that sparkled like a jewel under the noonday sun. We knew that this must be the Isle of Legend at once. It was the Mani Dwipa. As we alighted, we saw soft flowers and mystic trees and beautiful uh, roses and other beautiful flowers and trees everywhere. All kinds of sweet birds were singing all around and the very air was fragrant with music. A panel on the crystal sh ship opened and we descended. When we had wandered a brief way, marveling at the beauty of the ocean isle, we were rested by a dazzling brightness that shone from a glade some way ahead. We approached cautiously and for a moment stood spellbound by the sight that met our eyes. We saw a splendid pavilion and within it the mystic throne that is called the Shiva Shiva Kara, 
whose four legs are Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, and Dharma. It was brilliant as a rainbow. A glimmering cover lay over it, encrusted with generous gemstones of incredible radiance. But these paled before she who reclined languidly on that couch, bright as a streak of lightning. Her dark body was perfect and anointed with fragrant sandalwood paste. She wore a crimson garment and a scarlet garland around her throat. Her eyes were reddish as well, and so entirely enticing that we stood staring at her unbashedly, for we were under her spell. The ba Devi Bhuvaneshvari sat there, a smile on her lips, Two of her hands held a noose and a goad, and the others were raised in mudras of protection and blessing. We three, Brahma, Vishnu, and Mahesh, who created, nourished, and destroyed the universe, had never seen or even dreamt of such beauty as hers. Why, we realized that the birds in the blessed place sang the occult mantra, Hrim, which belongs to the lady, whose skin is the color of the rising sun in her youthful lush bloom and who is merciful past understanding. Vishnu, Shiva, and I never, had never seen the Devi Bhagavati before, and we stood transfixed by her beauty, wondering who she was and what she was called. Ah, uh, even as we gazed at her, suddenly she was transformed. The ineffable young woman stood before us with infinite eyes and infinite limbs. Then Vishnu whispered, It is the Devi Bhagavati, the mother of us all, the Mula Prakriti. She is the Satchitananda. Look, the Shaktis and Vibhutis surround her. I saw her upon the primal sea as I floated there in the banyan leaf as a child when the Kalpa begin, began. She sang softly to me, I remember, like a mother to her child. It was the song of the universe. Let us approach the mother. She wants us to, else we would not be here. We went nearer, and then the Devi smiled at us. Instantly, we found ourselves transformed. Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva had become three women. We had become our own Shaktis. We were young, and we were beautiful, and now we were allowed to approach the Devi, saying, Om, we entered her pavilion. From outside, it had seemed small enough, but when we stepped in, we realized it was infinite, as was she who sat upon her splendorous throne and shone with the brilliance of a million suns. We bowed at her feet and heard her laugh softly. We soon realized why. In her crimson toenails, we saw the universe. And that was just the beginning of all the visions we saw in the Devi's presence. We were lost in wonder for a hundred years, for we saw not just this universe, but countless others. Then we <coughs> sang hymns to the Devi, and Shiva said, Bhavani, we have forgotten the Mula Mantra we once had from you. If we are to create, nurture, and destroy the universe in this couple as well, give us that mantra again. And she gave it to us once more from her own lips. She said gently, Shakti enlivens the Purusha. You will have need of your Shaktis before you begin the universe again. And from her own body, she created the three Devis, who are the consorts of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva through the Manvantaras. She came to us herself as Saraswati, Lakshmi, and Durga. And when we saw those three goddesses, we felt inspired. We knew we could begin our universe again. The Devi and her mantapa vanished around us. Just her, her mantra echoed softly everywhere, like the very air of Mani Dwipa. And we, through gods, were male again. Saraswati, Lakshmi, and Durga were, were with us now, and we climbed back into the crystal Vimana. It lifted away from the jewel island, and with a sigh and as swift as thinking, we were back upon the prim primal sea, the endless sea, where Vishnu has slain Madhu and Kataipa. 
and we're ready to begin our great task. For now we knew who the origin of all things was, whom we must worship, the Devi, the Divine Mother. So said Veda Vyasa to King Janamajaya. Jai Mahamaya ki jai vishveshvari mati ki jai bule baba ki jai.